Uh, we just uh, finished uh, with two really interesting presentation from from, uh, from Elisa Ronka, who is uh, head of digital market development um, uh, uh, for Europe at Siemens, and and Tomasz Polser, who is co-founder of uh, Urbanite Investors. Both of them, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> sharing their views on digital workplace, future of workplace, hybrid workplace, all these all these buzzwords that's been you know uh, going around in the in the last uh, 12 months or so since we since we started um, uh, going into into lockdowns it seemed like this whole pandemic has sort of you know accelerated all these trends that's been that had been going on um, uh, even before so uh, it, it's safe to say that um, we're living in really exciting times when it comes to uh, uh, office space workplaces uh, uh, and so on we have a very diverse uh, uh, panel with with great uh, speakers uh, today. Uh, we've got uh, Hubert Abt, uh, who is CEO of uh, New Work and Work Club 24. We have uh, Gavin Bonner, who is the Vice President of Genesis Property. Uh, Paul Deverell, who is Business Director of Future2. And John uh, Fakete, who is Executive Director and Head of Consulting Services for uh, JLL in the Middle East and North Africa, if I say it uh, correctly. So um, I'll just jump into the uh, jump into the middle because we ha we had a, a quite a lot of questions uh, all pointing to the same directions during the first two uh, presentations and um, and I wanted to uh, to start with that um, is that uh, both Elisa and Tomas has have um, have spoken about. Uh, major uh, uh, workplace trends, sort of, you know, soft uh, uh, trends um, that are, you know, uh, that are going on in with, with uh, large or, or, or smaller corporations. And a lot of our, um, our, our uh, viewers have asked what, you know, the, the real estate implications are uh, uh, of that. So will, uh, will there be uh, uh, less need for, for office space or, or um, you know, uh, the general uh, uh, general questions. So, so my first uh, question would be: Do you think that that all these you know trends that we've uh, just seen in these two uh, uh, presentations uh, will be translated into less office space, or or that's not the case? John, you want to start? Sure. I think the short answer is no. I don't think we'll see less square footage or less square meterage of office space, but we'll see it made up differently. Um, you know, we'll have third party locations, we kind of spoke in hub locations, and I'm sure some of my colleagues eloquently, but we did a survey at JLL, people still want to go to the office, but they want to use it, you know, for different activities, right? They want to switch off after hard tasks, they want to get feedback from their manager. They want to be able to concentrate and do individual work. They want to be inspired and create and innovate. So none of these things would translate into less space, right? So there might be, you know, the office will look different and the office will, you know, it'll be, it'll be set up differently, but it'll become a hub for, for collaboration. It'll become a hub for problem solving. It'll become a hub for career development. You know, things at home, you will still do stuff at home, but, you know, to collaborate, solve work-related issues, you know, really, really have some brain power, you'll do that in the office, and that equals space, you know, because you're going to have to be separated from people, you have to have social distancing, um, and, and so the layouts will be different, but I, I don't see the square, square meterage being less. And at least that's, that's our view. Right. Any comments on this, Gavin? Um, I would totally agree with those. I mean, one thing that we need to take into consideration is most companies have um, a fixed rental period, so there can't be any knee-jerk reaction. They're tied into leases. So even if the discussion about less space was coming up, they, they still need to negotiate that. But I totally agree that I, I think they have the entered into agreements for the space they require. I think now it's just a case of looking to how to utilize that space to a better end product. Um, when you think that, you know, companies have been hit hard by the, the pandemic, 
It's caused knee-jerk reactions that people are saying that they work from home, but not everyone wants to work from home. I, I think it's been forced upon them. And also, obviously, companies are being hit economically. So they're kind of thinking, well, can we keep those staff levels up? But we've got to be thinking that after a, a down cycle, there's the period of recovery. So we don't just plan for what's happening now. We have to plan for the scales of how we're going to recover from this current situation. So, so I totally agree. I think spaces will remain the same space as required now. I think spaces should become more agile, more flexible, so that we can adapt very quickly to these circumstances that we face. And I totally agree with what John was saying, that I think we need to look at how space is used. Um, it's becoming more and more reasonable that there is a social interaction as work, and gone are the days where you're shackled to your desk and told to get on with it and just left there. But those days have sort of passed. Now work is collaborative. We need to get people together in a more social environment. So again, that requires space. There is the distancing that John also mentioned that, you know, during the return to work, people won't feel as comfortable as being so close. This will take a little bit of time to change our psyche again. People are very conscious about social distancing. So they won't want to return to an office space where they feel that they're crammed in. So you still need to cater for those people, allowing for that additional spacing between them. All right. Paul or Hubert, any comments on? I just recently launched our uh, market report, which the first version was in April last year. <clears throat> and now in Feb, end of Feb, we broke the second uh, version on that, the updated one. And I must say, um, we, are, we are operating Flex Office with new work. And with WorkLoud24, we are working on digital products to manage workforce and like a digital office pass and things like that. So I can tell you the sales funnel on the first quarter 2021 is 50% down according to last year. So it's 50% less there. And if you see and you talk to the big brokers, no corporate clients out in the markets looking for space. Zero, zero. Yesterday I talked with several in Warsaw. They have 300 workstations at WeWork, which was used by Ernest and Young. It's a sublending mandate for two months. Digital campaign marketing zero leads, zero, not one, not ten, not one hundred, zero. Why is it? Because we are driving in the worst recession we ever saw, at least the ones which are now on the panel and maybe in the audio. And uh, the last circle of real estate, usually they take eight years, the, la the latest one was 12. So we need to get used to the idea that the next three, four years are getting harsh. But this is only recession, right? It comes back. I fully agree it comes back to a level of normal, which is the new normality. But what we can't ignore is the change in social habits. I mean, Thomas Polster was clear. 75% of the work desks, of the service-related work desks, are digitalized already. That means they will be used to work from home between two and three days a week. So roughly 50% of the workforce only comes back to the office at the same time. And companies will find um, tools to manage this workforce, like the office pass from WorkLoud or anything else. And this will lead to less space requirement. And this, the less space requirement will appear on the B-class building because nobody wants to be in a building where you can't fit the new standards on HVAC, air condition, touchless impact. You don't have a marketplace and so on and so forth. So yes, we will see an impact on space requirements and it will appear first on the semi-quality buildings and the new buildings will fight for new tenants. Everybody will hand the same tenants and uh, they will need uh, then, you know, really good arguments 
in terms of services, in terms of flexible offers um, to attract these tenants. Because at the same time, what we will uh, observe is there is a kind of urbanization. If you're going to my LinkedIn profile yesterday, I reposted a post from the World Economic Forum. Ireland indicated 400 small villages to urbanize, reurbanize the villages by making workspaces there. So to attract people to live in the village and to work in the village. Of course, they will not stay in the village five days a week for working, but they will use the village life, not only the weekends, they will extend the weekend experience with the family because they have a much better quality there and will use these workspaces also for two, three days a week. That means they're only coming back to the hubs in the centers for two days. And that all together, you combine it, is 30% less space requirement on the top occupiers. And that's basically not our opinion. That's based on a McKinsey survey from October last year. And if you want to have another proof, CBRE made this uh, occupier survey also in November last year. And more than 75% of the executives of the occupiers said clearly, we will invest in technology which enables us to manage our space, means our workforce requirements better. So if you have better tools to manage your space, that will lead to less space requirement. Today, an average office is occupied 76% of the time. With the new tools, with the digital tools and the work from home place, it, it will go down to 40%, 45%. That was the finding of, of the previous, of Tomasz. So with 45% commercialization, you think you start thinking on a company, even with a good margin, what can I do to save money? And again, we're coming to a recession. We are not there, but we are full speed into. And that will lead to a lot of think tanks. And maybe if you are right, it will stay with the space, but for sure the requirement will towards flexible core flex models, right? So I, I see it a bit more different than you guys, but um, the good thing in life, we have time <laughs> to, to find out who was right. I see a bit the real estate industry and the self-fulfilling prophecy models, you know, why should it be a change? And it was so nice. The party was always good. And, you know, every day in the year, the meet team, you came back and say, oh, the party goes on, the party goes on, the party goes on. Uh, I'm afraid the party is over for the next three, four years. All right, Paul, any, any comments on that? I want to move on quickly, I should imagine, but um, I think it will all depend a lot on um, who you work for, what sector you work in, um, and what, what your boss a uh, advocates. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think we also need to look at, uh, hopefully, that we're coming out of this situation we found ourselves in for over a year now, um, and how things will look. Um, when when we do get, let's say, a sort of gradual green light, um, I think our discussions will change. So I, um, I'm a little bit more of an optimist. Um, I don't think uh, we're going to go into a major recession. I think people are going to be, um, you know, uh, very motivated to get back to it, get working, um, and move forwards. Jonathan, can I just say that? You know, the only, you know, we surveyed 2,000 people uh, and 75% of those want to go back to work. So they're going to need space. They're going to need more different type of reconnection. But all we can do is kind of look outside the prism of Europe and look into those places that have vaccines, have people going to work, you know, look at look towards Asia, um, look at some places even in the Middle East where I am. and once people feel safe, the employers, you know, will, will probably mandate them people coming back to work. So this work from home thing is is a is a nice to have while they're they're not able to, to work to work in the office all the time. But we're we're not gonna go to a to a completely work from home model. If you look at Asia now, look at Singapore, look at Hong Kong, um, those places that have opened up, at least in in within New Zealand. Um, people are going to the office, so so you know I I could see that there are potential some type of 
but as far as total stock of office space, there's still going to be. Agree that people are really desperate to going back to office, and, and very clear. This is our common desire to interact and to collaborate. I 100% uh, agree with that. But I just say, due to the possibility of digitalization and to the fact that companies need and had to change their policies now, once you are able to work from home and it's convenient to do that two days, let's say only two days a week, um, then, you know, with a rolling, a rotating system for the companies, it will lead for the workforce that overall you need less space. That's all what I say. And what I also say is that the digitalization is an exponential graph. That means a few people which are now unemployment or working somewhere, not in the office anymore, will never come back to work again. Right. So we also, in the banking sector, maybe as a best practice example, I would say 20% or 30% of the people which are now out will not coming back again, not work from home and not in the office at all because the artificial intelligence will take over their jobs. Right. And there is no replacement. And that's a, I mean, this is part of the digitalization anyway. And it just was triggered super boosting by, by COVID now. Right. Um, we, you guys uh, also mentioned um, um, whether employees are going to back to the office and for how many days. We also had a poll here earlier, and most of the people uh, said that they they're they're ready to go back to the office for one or two days a week. Um, uh, does any of you have any any views or any experience uh, uh, with that? How that might look like will re people really just you know spend i don't know two one or three days in a week in their office is is there any 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 indication for for trends in in this regard clearly the trend to flexible office space is driven by uncertainty in the future but it's also driven in a way you know that the collaborative work at home is not working, so you need to find a place where you can meet and greet. And as the 10 or the six feet rule from Jones Lang, the six feet office now doesn't allow the workforce to come back to the headquarters, even so uh, we would eliminate COVID, which will never happen, of course. But even so, we say uh, we do not need this anymore than the six feet office days. The social distancing only happens on a bigger space. Uh, and so for, um, of course, you need to have a digital tool to manage the workforce intelligent, but there are a, a few providers already out in the market um, and they going hand in hand with the office tenant apps and with the parking apps and with the car share apps and all this digital environment together with shared economy uh, will lead to the possibility for the companies to manage the workforce remotely. So. There is no doubt that this will work well. So, Trinad, I think, you know, we once again, I'm just going to refer back to empirical data, the facts, right? So, we took, we did a survey, or 2,000 people responded. Globally, before COVID, people used to work from home about half a day a week, and now they work about two days a week from home globally. North America, it's 2.2 days. Europe, it's actually less, about 1.6 days a week after COVID. In Asia Pack, it's also high days a week. So I don't, you know, I don't see that being drastically different. I don't, I don't see the majority of time spent for typical consultative uh, people who need to be in the office at, at less than, you know, two days. Or, or people from home, I don't see them spending more than two days a week. And, and our global, you know, and all I can do is refer to our global survey results that two thousand other people agree with me. I would tend to back that up as well. We as Genesis Property, we've also undertaken some surveys and, and most are very keen to get back to work. Now, picking up on a, a point that Paul mentioned, it, it's the type of work. Um, some works put themselves in a position where working from home is a lot more simpler. When you look at teamworks and creative thrust, maybe that's better to be done on a face-to-face -face basis in an office in a social space. 
So it also depends on the company, the company breakdown on what they're trying to implement because certain creativity and teamwork is expanded better and people feel part of that when they are together in a common block. It also helps to educate, etc. You know, people don't want to feel remote and isolated from what their company is doing. They want to feel part of that company and returning to the office with their colleagues in social spaces, etc., allows them to do that and helps promote the productivity. So we think that home working is definitely going to be in the new hybrid. We don't think it's a new policy. We think many companies have already adopted home working. What has happened is the pandemic has made people focus a lot more on it and maybe start to break out what suits home working and what doesn't. And even in that equation, we're saying home working, but many people's home environment may not support that necessary home working either. And that could be from their personal standpoint or their family standpoint. So we've even seen cases where home working has been pushed forward because of the pandemic, but they've actually gone to hotels or other areas to work because they physically couldn't get their work done at home. And I also think just to put a pin on pin on that, I think it's also generational. And maybe we'll talk later about the emotional requirements of employers, right? But uh, you know, you have people entering the workforce that don't want to work from home. They want to be with other people. They want to, you know, they, they don't want to work from you know, they don't want to be in the office all the time, but they want to collaborate. And to Hubert's point, you know, there might be less demand for more office space. And you know, I said that I think that the amount will be stagnant, but the way the office will look inside will be different, right? You'll have less people, I agree, but those spaces are going to be a lot different. So there's, you know, there's, there'll be opportunities for interior design and, and, and some technical things and to, to change that workspace for sure. But the footprints of the offices may not go down as drastically as, as people think, because you're going to need more space per person, not for your workstation, but to do other things in the office and socially distant. Right. Our money is uh, on book models. That means we are bringing Mark Dixon's uh, uh, footprint. Also, you know, Jones Lang predicts 30% <clears throat> flex uh, in the future instead of 4 to 5% now. Uh, so I guess, yes, uh, if you sum it up in the, in the economy of real estate, Maybe the reduction on space will indeed only impact the B-class buildings, but the hubs will, the, the space requirement per company in the hubs will shrink and will be diversified in satellites, uh, which they then uh, need, you know, to allocate their, their remote and hybrid workforces in a way, which of course in the entire balance and the space balance will be then accumulated there again, but it will be, it will trigger uh, um, definitely the need for more flexibility in the space itself. What we see since we uh, launched the franchise concept, we're getting a lot of, of demand and interest in the markets because everybody knows already that, uh, you know, we need to implement at least one part of our entire space should be flex. Uh, and it's also a little bit of thing, maybe it's not a big thing for the office industry, but it's a thing for the retail industry. Uh, they are suffering due to e-commerce and lockdowns and they need to attract uh, the quality of staying in the shopping malls more so it goes more on a one-stop shop concept and that integrates as well workspace so we will find workspaces in places which today we may be not uh, perceive like in train stations you know <laughs> the swiss train station operator said we will have 76 co-working spaces basically in each train station in switzerland you will have a co-working space and so does the Germans and this is a trend which follows and this part of the space is not allocated in the hub anymore, right? So I, I think if I would be an asset manager or a developer, uh, then I, I would rethink a little bit the design and the functionality of the so-called monoculture offices, uh, which was in the past always working, but maybe in the future it needs a little bit more of services and flexibility. 
Yeah, I guess hybrid hybrid uh, uh, verb based solution is definitely um, uh, one of the conclusions of uh, of today's conferences uh, so far. Uh, in in Eliza's presentation, um, again, she's um, she's the head of European uh, uh, Smart Office at Siemens. She uh, she uh, defined three uh, phases uh, when it comes to uh, what we are experiencing uh, with the uh, pandemic and uh, and and working from home. And the phase one was crisis management. So basically, when you know uh, pe all people were uh, were sent home or just went home uh, on their own, and um, it was pretty much you know working from home for most um, uh, office workers. And phase two is a workplace reentry. And phase three is the next normal, a new normal, or whatever. I, I, I'm I'm not sure where we are right now, but uh, I guess it depends on on industries and countries. But I I would say that that in in, in Central Europe we're somewhere in 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 phase two, which is workplace um, uh, re-entry, um, which uh, brings up uh, um, you know a question of health and safety for employees and how they how they feel um, about how, whether they feel you know safe and secure about their office space uh, and I just wanted to ask you guys um, uh, how do you think landlords uh, uh, building uh, um, uh, managers can can address that uh, that challenge of of health and, and safety at the office space especially in these let's say well early early um, times of, of workplace re-entry or, or, or fragile uh, um, uh, um, uh, phases. Gavin? Certainly at Genesis what we've looked at is we've created what we call the immune building standard um, and what that is focusing on is pure physical uh, uh, health of people. Um, it, it's looking at can the buildings better perform against bacterial um, threats, pandemic threats, viral threats, pollution? And, and in essence, we sort of reevaluated why our buildings aren't doing more to protect our health. Obviously, this time round, when we were hit with the pandemic, there was a bit of a we don't know what to do, what's going to happen next. So we think that it, it's wise to start looking forward and saying, well, if we are having to face this, let's use the lessons learned to make sure next time round we are ready. Um, we're, we're in a better um, position to combat these sort of viral threats or pollution threats. So in essence, we, we look through the buildings and saying sort of how are these things transmitted? You know, that they're either through the air. So we took a look at how we can improve air quality. It could be through contact. I heard earlier, I think it was you that mentioned touchless, touchless technologies coming into play. It's through water systems, it's through social distancing. So in essence, we put together a, a, over 120 measures that buildings could apply that would start to hopefully protect those buildings and provide a healthier environment. We can't obviously say that they will stop everything, but they can at least reduce it and make it more controllable through the phases. Um, I think many will have heard, you know, the current situation is like you hear the bug is flying around the office or the, the bug is flying around the schools. We're sort of questioning why is that? Why should these things transmit so quickly throughout premises? Um, we looked at that well-known fact, which I'm sure everyone has seen in the papers and articles, that 90% of our time is within the built environment. So we're kind of saying, well, shouldn't that built environment be producing the most healthy environment it can for you? So we think one of the next steps on people's return and moving forward is to really look at how the building can better protect your health as occupants within that building. And that was where we looked at these, um, the, the immune standards. Right, uh, Paul, any comments? Yeah, um, well, aside from cleaning, I mean, that's pretty much the obvious first, <laughs> first step, isn't it really? Um, obviously, as we deal with um, building systems and equipment, um, I'm, I'm going to probably answer from from a uh, my my view from that angle. Um, but we 
we tend to um, have earmarked uh, four areas, which of course is air, air quality, uh, light, touch, which of course is, is what Gavin mentioned, I think you also mentioned, um, and, uh, and, um, and clean. So we, we really focus our uh, advice when we're advising a landlord and uh, also more and more tenant, tenants, um, what they should be looking at. And obviously, I, can, I won't go into too much detail because uh, I don't want to ramble on too much, but obviously the associated um, building systems need to perform according to those rules. Um, and whether you have uh, indoor climate policy or not for the building, um, are, is your building performing uh, how, how you think it is? Because we have just a very quick example, seen cases where building managers um, were receiving alarms from equipment um, and were making um, then adjustments. And then we found out that uh, the ventilation equipment wasn't connected to the building management system. Um, and therefore, you know, they, they, these very basic things should be the starting point. Um, HVAC, how it's being controlled, um, are the sensors calibrated? Was the equipment installed correctly from the beginning? Um, has continuous commissioning been performed, i.e. Uh, regular, regularly checking the calibration of those systems, regularly checking the um, CO2 levels, uh, air pressures, um, and, and you know we can go on from there really, which we, as we know the equipment has improved dramatically in the last 10 years. If we take just for an example, motors which control the little fans which bring the air into the building and, and send it out again. Uh, yeah, we're talking about now 90% efficiency of, of an EC motor versus previously 35, 45% efficiency. So uh, again, I'm bouncing around a little bit it is a big subject as I'm sure, sure you'll imagine, but uh, generally we, we like to st st start with the nuts and bolts before we advise on any, let's say, um, add-on systems um, and and that yes so so in a nutshell. <laughs> Tonight I think that just to augment what these guys are saying that when we looked at when we surveyed these people we looked at what new services are would, would employees or tenants individual tenants take a look at top three well-being services 73 percent goes back to cleanliness, advanced food services, making sure that the bubble you're in, the food is, is prepared properly, and health services. Health services, anything from what Gavin are saying to, to on-site clinics, but, but those all scored over 70% in the respondents and even much higher for those under 35. So, you know, things that scored low, care, beauty services, cultural services, which used to be always at the top of people's lists, those are all below 50% right now, and it's advanced food, health, and well-being that have scored the highest. So, so I think that's what Paul and Gavin has, have, have said. So preferences are changing, at least, you know, for the time being. Definitely. We're seeing a big shift to this because beauty and childcare and all this stuff used to always be at the top. And now across the globe, you know, the 2,000 people they're less than, you know, they're still important, but they're not as important as the other things. I, I think also one, one important thing to touch on is that um, occupiers are now um, also looking at their own footprint, carbon footprint. And as we know, there are several standards which are springing up for, for not, not only for landlords and, and, uh, and building owners, um, which I think was sort of primarily the focus is, is that, you know, the building owner is solely responsible for making this happen, for making these improvements happen, is where now, of course, the, the, the occupiers are more and more looking at their own um, um, practices. And I'm sure we've heard, you know, this Energy Star recognized and other ratings. So what, what we are hoping and what we're seeing um, is that the alignment between occupier and owner uh, and owner is going to become closer. Um, and as 
either party has some type of reporting requirement, if not already, but will have in the future, not all landlords, of course, but a majority or a high number of landlords will have that, as well as tenants, there needs to be a, uh, a collaborative approach. And as, as we're, I think, all quite, quite aware of, that the, the, the actual consumption of the building is around 60% of the tenants are actually consuming 60 or 70% of the energy in the buildings. So if there is a nice collaborative approach um, where you know, tenants are also aware and have good housekeeping rules, um, I think that's, that's, that's the way things would, would, will and should move forwards. Right. Uh, I, admit, I, I totally support that. One of our, our thought patterns is the technologies exist now to actually, when you walk in a building, after this pandemic, everyone is going to be very cautious and wary about what's happening and what they can catch, etc. And one of our thoughts is that buildings should be able to talk to the occupants. The, the, the technology is available, all the sensors are available. So instead of people as they walk in the building thinking, well, what sort of environment am I, am I entering? One of the measures that we put it in is having an immune digital twin, which will display the data of what people can't see, such as air quality, but will inform them of it. So it's useful data when people enter into the building, they can at least enter it knowing what type of building they are entering and what are the potential risks or non-risks or how that building is catering for them for them all of the technologies are available but we just think there should now be a bigger link between the building talking to the tenants that occupy it and vice versa the occupants talking to the building that they inhabit and so we, we've looked at this immune digital twin to give that level of information to people either occupying or even visiting the building yeah I, I absolutely second that sorry jumping in i know i'm, I'm jumping my turn here but just to, to reiterate what, what gavin said there's you know this data is available from the building management system or from some type of systems that have already are already in the building so it's just a question of connecting that data either to some type of building app um you know it, it could be you know building branded uh, where you're getting that data and i think what we'll see is this this will become a standard in in most buildings you will either look at your phone or look up um i don't you know there are a few developers of course who've already um pioneered this and installed this in their buildings and i think it will just it will become a standard and an expectation by occupiers and and users of buildings i guess we basically can summarize it's the first time in in real estate that offices office owners really taking care on the needs of their tenants after they signed the lease right and 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 that's the that's the big change what the what the retail industry already went through 30 years ago or 40 each shopping center manager takes care of each single tenant every day if he has the possibility because he knows it's so important to interact with the tenants after signing the lease and make them more successful but in office industry it was always you know once the lease is signed that's okay and then you know we talk to them again when we need to extend the lease or renegotiate it and now we really start that the building needs to talk to the tenant we need to switch the space as an office to space as a service and that it's not only true for the flex operator it's only also true for the for the property owners, for the for the property managers. Also, it goes up to the asset managers. They need to reserve a certain budget, you know, for the well-being certificates, call it well-being certificates in US. It's called forhealth.org. You know, there are the foundations of healthy buildings, but that's only the technical foundations, not the service aspects. And I'm sure I guess the lead certificates are in the market for 20, 25 years. Soon, um, institutional investors will not go for investing in a building or purchase a, 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 a property without having these certificates in place. So that's a big thing. That's a big thing for PropTech, but it's a much more bitter thing to change the mindset of the owners 
towards the user or the clients and the tenants needs. That's for sure. Right. Uh, Gavin said the sentence, uh, the technology exists and, and true, uh, but but so far uh, the property industry has um, well hasn't really used uh, 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 all these all these tech um, uh, tools and digitalization was uh, was very low compared to uh, other major uh, industries john do you think uh, that that this whole you know pandemic and and all these things that have changed in the last 12 months do you think that that, that um, digitalization will, will speed up uh, in, the, in the property industry as a result Can you ask the question again? My, I think my line was buggy. Sorry. Yeah, right. Well, the, the question is simple: whether whether you think all these changes uh, uh, due to the pandemic will accelerate the, the digitalization in the property industry? Yeah, I think always. You know, I'm not a historian, but back if you look back in history, you know, big crises have always accelerated change. Right? If you things you think people don't want to change, especially property owners, to Hubert. So they don't want to change unless they're forced to change, and and so they they people have had it pretty good for so long, but this will definitely force uh, change on digitalization, on how people use the office. A absolutely, I, I see that I see that happening, and the access to information, um, and the access to for each individual to information, right? So you can go in, log in on your app book your workstation on your way to work or the night before you can see who's sitting around you uh, all these things you weren't able to do before as a user and now more most organizations this is completely normal thing that you you're gonna have an app to be able to book a desk because you don't have your your own desk anymore and you'll be able to you know book collaboration areas and and maybe to gavin and, and paul's point maybe in that app you'll have that day to make you feel better to go in right so everything's fine all there and you're you're excited to go in and do more work so absolutely turn at it i think that this this is really uh kick-started uh, a digital revolution of, of how people use technology in a, in a in a traditional office building right um i'd like to uh, at this point encourage <clears throat> our audience to uh, to ask any questions as we're getting um uh getting to the end of our of our discussion there there was a question earlier um um asking how has overall office space demand developed in the regions that have opened up post covid um for example china hong kong new zealand etc um and actually, uh, Thomas Polster, our previous presenter, has, has, um, has partly uh, answered uh, uh, that question, saying that demand for space in Asia uh, post-COVID is interesting. However, response to very different social and residential triggers compared to Europe, many people don't have the right environment to work from home, and social hierarchy requires more face-to-face -face interaction. John, do you have do you have any data or or experience on 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 um, on these? Um, these Asian uh, uh, vacancy or or office demand uh, um, trends. We, we may I, have I, think it's, I think it's a little early. The video. I can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Chana, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I think it's a little early to look at you know. To, historical vacancy dates but definitely we see you know in asia that people are going back to work at a higher rate um and as i said before it's just early to just, just talk about demand for office space right we're not even we're not even out of the pandemic yet um we'll, my answer is we'll see but i i think that the the places that will recover quicker are those in asia because they they will recover quicker from the pandemic. Right. Uh, Just from our side, I, I know that we've been in contact with different um, entities in, in Asia about the immune building standard, um, because one of the things about returning to the office is people need to feel that they're returning to a safe environment. I mean, I know that their prediction at home, they may not suit home working. 
but before they return to the office, they want to know that their office is a good place to return to. Now, with all the technologies in the offices, it should provide a viable return because there are filtrations of, um, air, uh, of the air that you won't actually find probably in your own residence where you're based. So there's, there's a lot of things and technology and basic services that are provided in the office that make it a better environment. Obviously, on the downside is more people you will come into contact with. But I know that there is um, some very keen interest in making the buildings a more protective against such transmission of health diseases. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if there are no more uh, questions uh, from the audience, I'd like to uh, say a huge thank you to our uh, to our speakers and, uh, and especially our uh, panelists here. Uh, I think the um, you know the topic is really exciting, and uh, and we're only entering you know the uh, the phase of of seeing uh, companies going back to work. So I think we'll have a, a lot more to talk about in the in the next uh, couple of months. So we'll definitely um, uh, we'll definitely have more events uh, and 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 more articles, more research uh, uh, on that. Hopefully uh, with with you guys as well. So thank you. Uh, Thank you very much again for for joining it was great um, great having you here